Majo. Majo. Coramente. Coramente. Cucura. Cucura, Jonah. Cora, Jonah. The boy's wrists were tied so that his arms hugged the trunk of the large oak tree. His face was pressed against it as if it were the bosom of the mother he had never known. His back glistened red with blood. Whack! The whip cut into his flesh again, but he did not scream or even whimper. Master Riley had ordered his 20 slaves to watch what happened to someone who dared run away. And like a black crescent moon, they stood in a semicircle near the tree. At the center was the old African. His face was as expressionless as tree bark. The slaves did not see the blood on the boy's back, nor hear the flies droning around the red gaping wounds. They were staring at a picture in their minds, a picture of water as soft and cool as a lullaby. They did not know how the old African was able to make them see water as blue as freedom. But he had done it to them often. You have the power. This was what the old African's father had told him when he was a boy, had told him before he was taken across the water that stretched forever and brought here. Had told him before he became the old African. He was Jaja then, God's gift. No one here knew his name, all of them. Even Master Riley said he had been born old and had been born old looking. Though he wasn't, not if you counted birthdays, Whack! As the whip tore yet more skin from the boy's back, exposing the raw, red, bloody meat of his flesh, a shaft of searing pain struck the old African in the chest as the boy cried out for the first time. The old African almost staggered from the intensity of it but quickly focused his energy and pushed the pain down into his abdomen, through his legs and feet, and into the earth. The old African could have known any of their most secret thoughts. Sometimes he spoke to them in their minds though his lips never moved. But no one had ever heard his voice in all the years he had been on the plantation. Not even May, who called and talked to him almost every day 
and was standing beside him now. The old African had trained himself not to eavesdrop on the souls of others, merely to satisfy his curiosity. But when any of them were in pain, he slipped inside their souls as effortlessly and quietly as a bird going from a tree to the ground. And he pulled, he pulled, he pulled the pain from the channels of their souls as if it were a worm in the earth. Sometimes, however, like now, the pain was too great, too great for him alone, and he needed their minds. But they had not been trained since childhood to focus on a single object for hours without letting their minds and feelings tremble as much as a leaf when a bird alit on a twig. What? The boy cried out louder and the old African felt waves of pain as high and stony as mountains. He had not known such pain since the journey across the water that stretched forever. If Riley did not stop soon, the boy would die. Riley turned and faced the slaves, his hands on his hips, the heels resting lightly on the hilt of a knife in a scabbard on one side and the handle of a pistol in a holster on the other. I ought to kill that nigga, but I won't. He ain't the first one of y'all what run away. You know me, I don't get upset if one of y'all wants to sneak off to see your wife or husband or one of your children what live on a nearby plantation. Hell, I'd probably do the same. But I ain't got no tolerance for a nigga what runs off and don't plan on coming back. It took me two weeks to find this nigga. And when I found him, he was down by the ocean. That's right. If any of you tries a stunt like that, I will beat you to death. You understand me? I will kill you just as sure as my name is John Riley. The boy's heartbeat was so faint now that the old African dared not to wait any longer. He went quickly over to the tree and without hesitating, May followed. Quickly, they untied the boy's wrist and he slumped unconscious into May's arms. The old African put his right hand over the boy's heart and pressed down firmly. Immediately, he felt a warmth flowing, flowing from his heart, through his arm, and down into the boy's heart. After a moment, it began beating with a stronger and more steady rhythm. What the hell do you think you're doing? Riley yelled at the old African. Are you deaf? I said to leave him tied up until morning. Riley's upper lip curled into a, a sneer and his eyes lusted with the desire to shed more blood. He jerked the pistol from its holster. The old African turned his head and stared at Riley. Obasi had taught him how to look at a man and cover his mind so that he forgot what he was supposed to be doing. To look at a man and make it impossible for him to move. To look at a man and squeeze the blood from his heart, causing him to die where he stood. 
But Obasi had also taught him that just because he had a power, it did not mean he was supposed to use it. Riley, Riley began trembling visibly. The old African was the one doing all of this, all of this stuff, whatever it was, trickery, voodoo. Riley was sorry he had ever bought him. He had tried to sell him many times, but who would buy a slave who never spoke a word and looked like he would kill you in your sleep as easily as you killed a mosquito? Well, John Riley was not going to wait around for that black son of a bitch to work some hoodoo on him. If there was any dying to be done on the Riley plantation, that bastard was going to do it. Riley tried to turn and fire the pistol at the back of the old African as he carried the boy to the cabin in the woods where he lived apart from the other slaves. But Riley's arms were as heavy as stones and he could not turn his body. Suddenly, the pistol dropped from his hand and he stumbled over his feet and almost fell as he ran to get away, ran to the house where he would drink bourbon until he passed out. He did not know that the old African would know the exact instant he passed into unconsciousness. Akiwawa! Macho! Omumba! Volani! Volani! Coromante! Akiwawa! Coromante! Akiwawa! It happened so quickly. One minute he had been asleep, one arm around Ola's back. The next there were screams and yells and shouts. Oh, oh, shout, oh. And then men bursting into his home and grabbing him and Ola, tying their hands behind their backs and pushing them outside. Oh, back in Africa. Oh, the memory. Quickly, he was separated from Ola. A rope was tied around his waist and then tied to the bound wrist of a man in front of him as his own bound wrist tied to a rope around the waist of a man behind him. Ola! Ola! Ja, 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 ja. Her cry came from somewhere in the, in the darkness. He looked for his parents, but it was impossible to see anyone clearly in the darkness. When dawn came, he saw that about 40 of them had been caught, mostly men. However, Jaja was happy when he saw that he was tied to Obasi. What is going on? What is happening to us? Obasi shook his head. I do not know, Jaja. There was sadness and fear in his voice. Notes Jaja had never heard from the music of Obasi's soul. It was light enough now for Jaja to see his wife a short distance away. Ola! Ola! Her face showed no joy at seeing him. No joy. She motioned with her head 
and he followed her gaze and saw four bodies on the ground, one of whom he recognized as her father. They were marched. They were marched for three days through the forest. Three days. Oh, Mola! Mola! Jaja did not recognize what tribe his captives belonged to or understand their tongue. Goma. Though several of them spoke enough of his to make themselves understood, and whenever he asked where they were being taken, the captors responded with a laughter that bristled with the hostility of secrets that <laughs> <laughs> the men and women were kept separate, and Jaja could only look at Ola, her skin as softly back as a crow's flight. They had known each other since they were children, had always known they would marry, had known they would have each other for as long as there were stars tried to use the power to push away the fear he saw in her eyes. If he did not do something, the fear would eventually trickle into her spirit and take her away from him. Shortly after, they began marching again on the third day. came a noise, unlike any Jaja had ever heard. It had no beginning, middle or end, no high tone or low, just a constant and unchanging roar, like some beast that never had to pause for breath. What is that? What is that? They asked their captors and each other. Their captors laughed again. <laughs> Oh, they laughed. <laughs> they laughed a laugh that did not bring smiles to anyone's lips, not even their own. As they got closer, the roaring became louder. 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 Finally. Jaja recognized it as the sound of rushing water. But he could not imagine a river so large that its sound would fill the sky. Before too much longer, the path through the palm and coconut trees ended and the captured ones emerged from the forest into a bright and harsh sunlight against which they had to close their eyes. The earth had changed from the dark hardness of the forest to a hot, loose whiteness beneath their feet, which moved and slid with every step they took. Spurting between their toes, they stumbled and staggered as they tried to maintain their balance. Jaja saw a group of men walking toward them, perhaps 10 or 15. Their skin was white like sorrow. Voices of the captured ones erupted into moans and screams louder than the rest of the water. Oh. Oh. 
Me want it puto. Me want it puto. Me want it puto. Came the shouts from the various ones, and they tried to raise their hands and point at the white man. Their people had heard stories about Mwane Puto, the Lord of the Dead, the Lord of the Dead. They were the color of bones. But their stories had not told them that there was more than one. Wane Puto. The captured ones knew now that they were going to be killed. No longer caring that they were tied to each other, they strained and pulled at their ropes, trying to escape, but their captors rushed forward and thrust spears against them. Spears against their bellies, looking as if nothing would make them happier than to push the spears into their flesh. When the lords of the dead reached them, they called and talked with their captors. Jaja saw one of the lords give their captors beads and they disappeared back into the forest. The lords of the dead cut the ropes from their wrists and from around their waist and replaced them immediately with iron cuffs around their wrists, ankles, and necks. Iron chains were then fastened on, linking each one to the other by the hands and neck. Anger filled Jaja when a lord tore off his clothing. But when the Lord took the clothing off, Ndulu, the man chained behind Jaja, Ndulu bit into the wrist of the Lord. The Lord screamed, he screamed, and tried to pull away. But Ndulu would not let go. Though blood from the wrist had begun trickling down his mouth and chin, then the Lord pulled a stick from his pocket and pointed at Ndulu. Bam! Jaja, startled, startled, startled at the loud noise, and his nose wrinkled at the smell of acrid smoke coming from the end of the stick. Then he felt himself being pulled down as Ndulu slumped to the ground, blood pouring from a hole in his head. Jaja found himself lying atop Ndulu so close that he heard his last gasp of life. <sighs> Boom! The stick was pointed at the sky. The captain stopped. Sit! Sit! When they were seated, the lords of the dead came among them. One held the neck of a captive while the other scraped the hair off his head. He used a flat piece of shiny metal the screams, oh, the screams. Oh, oh, the screams, the screams. They were as constant now as the roar of the water that stretched forever. And sometimes it took two lords of the dead to hold the captive still while his head was shaved. Oh, oh. oh. When Jaja's turn came, 
he kept his scream inside. Stand up! The captured ones were almost glad to have something to do, and their chains rattled as they got to their feet. Start walking! They moved stolidly down the slope toward the water, their feet more steady. Now on the hot white earth that shifted with their steps, Except for an occasional moan or a sob. The only other sound was the roar of the water that stretched forever. Boats were coming toward them from the house on the water. What was going to happen now, Zsa Zsa wondered. Were they going to be taken to that house? Then what? Nothing made sense except, except that the lords of the dead we're going to eat them. What else would they want them for? Sit! As they sat down, Jaja looked to his right where the land went upward. There at his top stood a huge building of stone. Steps curved from the building to the white earth and coming down those steps were what seemed like hundreds of captives chained to each other. As they reached the bottom of the steps, they were shoved into small boats that, when full, began moving toward the house on the water. Up! Up! It was their time. The lords of the dead pushed them down to the edge. The captured ones began screaming. Oh, oh. They're crying as the cold water lapped at their feet. But the lords of the dead forced them into the boats. The screams and the cries were as relentless as the roar of the water. A small boat was rowed to the house on the water by two lords of the dead. When they arrived, they were pushed and prodded up steps made of rope that hung down the sides of the house. Finally, all the captives had come up the ladder. There were more lords of the dead in the house on the water. Some of these, they rushed forward and made the captives line up next to each other in rows. The women in front, the men behind. Down, down below! Down below came a shouted command. And quickly, the captives were pushed into the bottom of the ship. Their cuffs were unlocked, and some began striking their heads against the sides of the ship, moaning and screaming while others rushed to go back to the steps but were beaten back with whips. Beaten back with whips. Jaja lay in the ship, the bottom of the ship. Three tiers of wide wooden books, three feet between each one. The captives were made to lie on their right sides. Their bodies curled against each other like spoons resting in a drawer. Zsa Zsa could feel the heat of the man behind him lying on his back. The man's knees resting in the crooks of Zsa Zsa's knees just as Zsa Zsa's head lay on the back of the man in front of him. His knees and thighs tucked in the crook of the other man's legs. Zsa, Zsa lay in the middle tier, which he found out quickly was the worst place to be. The worst place. Even though there were round windows that brought in air from the water, and open hatches in the ceiling let in more air. It was not enough for the almost 250 men, women, and children who lay as tightly against each other as feathers on a bird's wings. (laughs) 
Almost immediately, Zsa Zsa was covered with sweat. That was the man who lay against him as was the man he lay against as were the bodies of every man, woman, and child lying there. The smell of perspiration was too thick for the wisp of air coming in from the water to move against. Someone gagged at the odor and vomited. Then another, and another, and and another, and another. The next morning, breakfast was beans. As Jaja took the tin plate, he saw Ola a short distance away. A lord next to her, his hands rubbing her breasts, his mouth wide with laughter. (laughs) Jaja moved toward them immediately, but his path was blocked by Obasi. Get out of my way, Jaja told him. I cannot, Obasi whispered. You must not. I know what he's going to do to Ola. She needs me. Your people need you too, Jaja. They will need you more than ever now. You are the only one who has the power, but you have the power too. Basi shook his head. My power has grown weak and is no match for such cruelty as this. Listen to me, Jaja. My spirit is leaving me. I am not going to survive this. You must. Jaja shook his head. I do not want to, my teacher. I do not want to. Obasi nodded. I understand. But if you die, they too will die. Oh, not in their bodies, but here. He put his hand gently over his heart. Suddenly, there came a loud yell of pain. The Lord, who had been touching Ola, was grasping his neck, and when he pulled his hand away, there was blood on it. Jaja laughed. Ola had bitten him. The Lord reached to grab her, but Ola skipped away and ran towards the ship's side, where she jumped onto the railing, and without hesitating, dove into the water far below. (laughs) Jaja rushed to the side and looked down. Ola, Ola, he called. Jaja, Jaja, she called back. There was no fear in her eyes now. And as she sank, A smile lighted her face like the rising sun turns dark trees green. Ola, Ola! Oh, Ola. One morning, a few days after Ola became free, the white man who spoke their tongue came to Zsa Zsa. You, they say you are their leader. Jaja shook his head. They are mistaken. I don't think so. Come on. Jaja was taken to the other end of the ship where he saw Obasi laying as if dead. This one refuses to eat. They say you can make him eat. Jaja knelt beside his teacher and gently stroked his face. Obasi smiled. They did not exchange any words around this white man who understood their language, but each spoke by putting words directly into the other's mind. Jaja stood up. His spirit has left him. Among our people, if one spirit dies, there is no person. The Lord laughed the rise of Lehaw. 
Well, where you're going, nobody gives a damn about your spirit. He bent over Obasi. Listen, if you don't eat, I'm going to knock your teeth out and make you eat. Just because you force food into me, it does not mean I will live. We'll see about that. And without another word, the Lord hit Obi in the mouth as hard as he could. Jaja focused on the place of seeing. And as the pain began spreading through Obasi's face, Jaja drew it out and sent it winging, winging away onto the wind. Again and again, the white man hit Obasi in the face. And again, and again. And the teeth, his teeth hung loosely from his jaws as blood poured between his lips. But Obasi felt nothing. You have learned well, Jaja, in peace. In peace, in peace, master. Obasi was tossed overboard like a piece of meat that has rotted. Jaja watched as sharks came quickly to the body, where one moment there was a human being, the next there was only blood. He turned, he turned to look back across the expanse of sea on the other side of which was the place he called home. He knew now that he would never see it again. Whatever the place was to which the ship was bringing them, it would never be home. No one here would speak his language. No one here would know about the power. No one here would understand. You can only talk if there is someone who understands. No one in this new place could. Then, how could he speak? African awoke immediately. Those were the first words the boy had said in almost three days. The fever had broken. The old African pulled himself off the floor from beside the bed and made his way unerringly in the darkness to the pail of water by the fireplace. He took the gourd floating in the bucket, filled it with water, and brought it to the boy. The boy pushed the gourd away. No, 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 no. Water everywhere, water. Just as suddenly as he had spoken, he was again asleep. May, the lady said, Africa man, Oh, Riley told me to come tell you that you best be in the fields bright and early tomorrow or else you'll be under the field before noontime. You'll be under the field before noontime. The old African nodded. The message was not a surprise, however, he was surprised that Riley had told May to tell him instead of coming himself. It wasn't like Riley to use a slave woman to carry his threats. So, Riley was afraid of him. When a man like Riley became afraid, he was as dangerous as a hurt animal. Water, water, came a soft voice from the bed. May moved toward the bucket, 
by the stove, but the old African caught her by the arm, stopping her, stopping her, listen to him. May heard the words in her mind. She moved to the side of the bed. You want some water, Paul? Paul opened his eyes. May, he said. May, I saw water. May, I saw water. I saw water. The old African nodded, and he sent his mind into the house where the slave master lived. And there the old African saw Riley sitting in a chair at his desk, a bottle of whiskey to his left and his pistol to the right. And in Riley's mind, the old African saw himself lying dead on the ground outside his cabin, blood pouring from a bullet wound in his head. Riley standing over him, a drunken grin of triumph on his face. Riley had no intention of letting the old African get anywhere near the field tomorrow or any other morning. The old African had learned that to endure was a power. And just as he had been drawn to the boulder, so the slaves, after a while, were drawn to him. No matter no matter what happened, his emotions never rose or fell. He was there for them, like the boulder was there for him. But this morning, the old African's emotions crashed through his body like the water that rose and fell with the never-ending roar. Ocean! 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 That was the word. What if it was the same as the water that stretched forever? He had to be sure. He had to see for himself. It had been so long since he had used his power for anything except healing. An important part of his training had been learning to see the world as animals, trees, insects, and almost anything. That was how he knew which plants, roots, and tree barks were good for what ailments and wounds. He heard the whispers of weeds and flowers and leaves. Although he could still speak and listen to a tree or a lizard, he did not know if he still had the power to actually become them. The old African closed his eyes and pictured a bird in his mind, a bird with yellow eyes that could look down from the nave of heaven and see a rabbit running, a bird with wings as wide as salvation, a bird with a beak so sharp it could rip out the heart of a lord of the dead, a bird with talons that could grasp sorrow and squeeze the blood from him. He closed his eyes again. This time, he thought only of the bird's round yellow eyes. As he did, he felt his own eyes shrink in size. His heart beat faster with excitement as his mind shifted rapidly to the other parts of the bird, his head, wings, legs, talent and just as rapidly he felt his head shrink his arms extend into feathers his legs tighten and his feet turn into claws as he opened his eyes his wings opened too and he rose into the air. His wings beat in broad, graceful strokes until he felt a strong undercurrent of wind. And he let his wings rest on the wind 
as it took him high into the sky. High! Looking down, he could see the slaves in the field. Their backs bent, heads down, as they hoed at the weeds. To his hawk's eyes, May looked as close to him as if she were sitting across the table eating. He gave a hawk's cry. And May raised her eyes. Look, she called, pointing to the hawk wheeling in the sunlight high above them. The slaves shaded their eyes to stare at the bird. What you think it feel like to be that free? Little John May's brother asked. What would you do if you was free? May asked him. Nothing. That's what being free to me would be like. I could wake up in the morning and do nothing. What would you do? Me? I would be like that hawk there and fly at the sun. The hawk flew until it was directly over the ocean. It looked across the expanse of water to the point where water and sky seemed to meet. Somewhere beyond that place was home. Home! 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 Jaja could not believe that he was hearing himself say that word. Home. Rapidly the hawk flew back from where it had come. This time it did not stop. It did not stop to soar above the slaves working in the field. And when May saw the great bird flash past and then drop from the sky into the woods near the old African's house, she wondered. The old African resumed human form almost immediately after landing on the boulder. How wonderful it had been to be free. He had almost forgotten what it was like to be able to enjoy the warmth of the sun without a care in the world. But perhaps his flight would not have been as sweet if he had not known that he was going home. Going home. The clouds in the sky that day were not like the ordinary clouds that brought showers. These were tall and black and came in a procession one after the other. When the slaves in the field saw them, Henry, the oldest slave on the plantation, was the only one who recognized what they looked like. Slave ships, he exclaimed in his ancient voice. Them is slave ships. There looked to be hundreds of them with lightning dancing through their blackness like whips of fire and the claps of thunder rattled the dishes in the sideboard in Master Riley's dining room. Bolts of lightning, they leaped down from the clouds and hit John Riley's house like rifle shots. Breaking windows, splitting doors. Singeing rugs until the house itself burst into flames like a flower opening. (laughs) 
the thunder rolled back and forth. The thunder rolled back and forth like applause. And it was so loud, no one heard the scream ah! of John Riley as the flames turned him as black as the hold of a slave ship. Ojai, Ojai. The door of the cabin flew open just as the sky exploded with lightning and thunder from one end to the other. The land shook like it was sobbing with grief. The old African stepped inside just as the clouds opened and rain came down like rocks. May stepped back at the sight. The old African's face looked as if it were being lighted from inside his skull. She had never seen anyone who looked so alive. And then she knew. It was you, wasn't it? That hawk up in the sky that was looking down on us this morning, that was you. And this storm would come like God's own vengeance. That's your doing, ain't it? It is time to go home, Bio. The old African was smiling at her, smiling. She hadn't known he could. No, she hadn't known he could. She smiled and nodded her head. Come on. She motioned to Ojai. And the two ran through the rain to the slave quarters. And as the day began to break, they saw it. The old African stood at the edge of the woods and looked down the slope and out onto the expanse of water that stretched until it touched the sky. This is it, Ojai shouted. This is it. Ain't it the prettiest thing you have ever seen? The slaves nodded and muttered in awed agreement, but they noticed that the orange disk of the sun rising up from the water at the edge of the world. So what had happened? Had the Lord abandoned them by not sending clouds and rain to hide their presence? What were they supposed to do now that they were here? There was nowhere to go. How many want to go to Africa with me? The question appeared in all their minds at the same time. They looked at each other. What was the old African saying? What was he talking about? How were they going to get to Africa? There were no boats there. How? Slaves had begun wondering why they were still standing there. It was time to find some place to hide until they figured out what to do. Then little John exclaimed, well, look at that. Look at that. You see, there were May and the old African walking up out of the water. They were still holding hands that they, like they had just taken a stroll in the woods. The slaves rushed down to the water's edge to make sure it was them. They gathered around May, touching her arms and shoulders to see if she was really flesh and blood. As the old African turned and began walking back into the water, the slaves followed him. They squealed and giggled the water was cold, and as it touched them, they felt its power against their legs. Some became frightened. The old African sensed the fear immediately. 
Breathe deeply. In and out. In and out. The old African let them down to the bottom of the ocean as if there were steps to walk on. The people were surprised that even though they were in water, they did not feel wet, they did not feel cold, and once on the bottom, they walked like they were on dry land. Fish of every color and size swam around them as if seeing people walking across the ocean floor was something they encountered every day. Time disappeared as there was no morning and night in that realm. So the old African did not know how much time had passed before two sharks glided into view. He felt the people behind him shudder at the sight of the large fish. Though none of them had ever seen one, they knew they were in the presence of killers. A shark gently nudged the old African as if wanting him to change direction. He did so without hesitation and the two sharks took their places beside him, one on each side, and he let them lead. However, the old African himself became a little nervous when he began noticing more and more sharks swimming alongside them. He remembered how the sharks had torn Obasi to pieces like he had been dried straw. Were they going to do the same to them? But the sharks made no move to attack anyone. Finally, the old African saw ahead of him other sharks swimming back and forth across their path, blocking the way. But as he came closer, they swam aside. It took a moment for the old African to understand what he was seeing. There on the ocean floor, as far as he could see, were skeletons. One beside the other. Now, row after row after row, arms by their sides. Then, the old African heard a voice inside his head. We are sorry. We were made by the creator to eat living flesh. We are sorry we ate these and we have tended their bones in hopes that one day someone would come. And now you have. The old African could not stop the tears that came into his eyes as he stared at the rows and rows of skeletons. Which one was Ola? Which Obasi? And who were all of these others who were thrown or leaped from the decks of slave ships? So, so many. It seemed the skeletons stretched into forever. Thank you, the old African told the sharks. Will you do us a favor? We would be happy to. Please show us the way home. It is not far. The sharks began to swim away, and the old African and the others followed. Ojai thought he saw the skeletons move. Africa man, he called out. The old African turned back, and to his amazement, the skeletons were rising up and beginning to walk beside them. As far as he could see, behind him, skeletons walked as calmly as if they did not know that they were dead. But the sharks did not seem surprised by the procession they were leading. Soon, the old African felt the bottom of the ocean starting to rise. 
welcome home. Thank you. Thank you for everything, the old African told the sharks. And then they were gone. They were gone. The old African looked anxiously now as more and more emerged from the ocean. But he did not see anyone he knew. He did not see the only one he so desperately wanted to see. The waters were still once more as no one else came up from the ocean. The old African turned away. Wait! Wait, Bio said, touching his arm. Here come two that almost got left behind. The old African turned around and saw a man and a woman, and the woman was so beautifully black as a crow's flight for the first time since he had last called her name. He opened his mouth and called, Hola, hola, Jaja, Jaja. He ran down to the water. He ran down to the water and threw his arms around her and she threw hers around him. And they held each other like the sky holds the sun. Finally, Jaja turned and embraced Obasi, master. Obasi chuckled. <laughs> no, it is you I should address as master. Look what you have done. The sand was crowded with all the captured ones who had died or been killed and thrown into the water that stretched forever. Welcome home! Welcome home! All of them heard the same thing in their minds. Then Bayo and Oji laughed. It's okay to talk now, Africa man, Bayo told him. Zsa Zsa laughed. <laughs> yes, it was. They would understand him. Welcome home, he called out. Welcome home! Welcome home! Welcome Welcome home. Welcome home. Welcome home. Welcome home. 